This is the Monday, November 14th, 2016 episode of The History Author Show. Visit our iHeartRadio channel or subscribe on iTunes to enjoy a brand new interview every Monday morning. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore. How I miss those old towns of mine. The sawdust is gone from the floor. Where we harmonize, sweet Adeline, on the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys, oh, New York ain't New York anymore. Ladies and gentlemen, Gregory Peck. The world never seems as fresh and wonderful as comforting and terrifying, as good and evil, as it does when seen through the eyes of a child. For a writer to capture that feeling is remarkable. Perhaps that is why one book has been so warmly embraced by tens of millions of people. To Kill a Mockingbird, winner of the Pulitzer Prize, just about every other award a book can win. Hello and welcome. I'm your host, Dean Carianis, and this is the History Author Show on iHeartRadio. Today, our time machine's humming flux capacitor may sound like it's taking a sideways journey into the fictional. See if this story sounds familiar. It's the 1930s, in a small Alabama town that's rocked when a black man is charged with raping a white woman. Local lawyers avoid the case, not daring to embroil themselves or their families in the defense of this man, or to buck the system of racial segregation. Finally, one lawyer steps forward to offer the accused the defense we're all guaranteed under the Constitution. Will his efforts, against the thinnest of evidence, convince the all-white, all-male jury to convict the accused or to set him free? Will it condemn a man who may well have been wrongfully accused That's the plot of Harper Lee's classic, To Kill a Mockingbird, with Atticus Finch in the role of the idealistic lawyer. But it's also the story of today's book, My Father and Atticus Finch, A Lawyer's Fight for Justice in 1930s Alabama. The son invoked in the title is also an attorney. Joseph Madison Beck practices in Atlanta, teaches at Emory Law School, and has lectured at universities throughout the United States and abroad. In his look back at the role his father played in this sensational Depression-era case, Mr. Beck describes the tale of his dad, Foster Beck, defending Charles White, an African-American man accused of the same crime as Ms. Lee's fictional Tom Robinson. Okay, now that we've been briefed on the case, let's travel back to the Deep South in the 1930s with Joseph Madison Beck as he shares My Father and Atticus Finch. I'm joined on the line by Joseph Madison Beck, author of My Father and Atticus Finch, A Lawyer's Fight for Justice in 1930s Alabama. Thank you for making the time to talk with the History Author Show today. Delighted to be invited to talk. First, let me put your mind at ease and let me tease our listeners a little. We're not going to reveal the outcome of the Charlie White case on the show today. It just seemed like it was good broadcasting and good to keep people hanging a little bit on that. It only seems fair to you that if listeners want to know the end of this real-life legal thriller, they'll have to pick up my father and Atticus Finch. Does that sound about right to you, sir? Yes, that's great. I hope that somebody will take the time to read it because it's a fascinating and true story. You wrote this book because you felt it was a story that needed to be told. This wasn't just the idea of shoehorning your case into a famous book, a very successful book, but you tell this story of your father and Charles White because it's something that struck you that it had so many elements in it of what made the fictional story very exciting and compelling. Yes, that's right. Growing up in Montgomery, Alabama, whenever this story came up, my father and I talked about it. And then if I relayed that information to high school or college or law school friends, people would always say, that sounds like To Kill a Mockingbird. I got busy with law practice. I was in the Army for a while. And by the time I got back to really digging into this, my father had passed away. At that point, I didn't know the name of his client. And I did some research 
in the archives in Montgomery, Alabama, with state capital, and was able to find cases where my father had been in court and eventually to track it that way. There was also an interesting intercession along the way. I was on a fishing trip in upstate New York with a gentleman who was interested in the story, and he was the agent for Harper Lee, who, of course, is the author of To Kill a Mockingbird. He said he would like to ask her about this, and he did. And she wrote back a very cordial letter in which she said that she saw the obvious parallels, and there really are a number. And uh, she emphasized that her work was fiction, and she did not recall the case. That's part of the mystery of this whole thing. I, of course, take Harper Lee at her word. She's a great American hero. But it is conceivable that Harper Lee, who was 12 years old at the time, did hear about this case because of the considerable publicity in South Alabama newspapers about it. And Ms. Lee was, as I say, 12 years old, living in South Alabama. Her father was a newspaper editor and a lawyer. So it's possible she heard something about it. Doesn't matter. She wrote a novel that is fiction. My book is the true story. And ultimately, I was able to get the trial transcript, the opinion by the court, and quite a few newspaper articles about it, reporting on the case and the controversy. And you can imagine in 1938 in South Alabama, a white man defending a black man charged with raping a white woman was controversial. It was not what you call a client development <laughs> for lawyers these days. But, you know, at the same time, I want to emphasize, Dean, that some of the people in my father's town were very kind to him and understood that he was doing the right thing. Others, not so much. When you write that letter, by the way, to Harper Lee's agent, that's June 1992. And I wanted to point out the date because here we're recording this in 2016. So a long time passes between publishing your book and writing that letter. So it really is something that sticks in your mind for a long, long time. Was there ever a point where you thought, I don't know if I'll be able to tell this story because there were so few kernels of information that you had, or did you always feel eventually you were going to write this book? Actually, there were times when I despaired that I would ever get to the bottom of it. But you're right. After Ms. Lee's very gracious note, encouraging me to continue to research it and try to find that information about it, I decided to, to do just that. And ultimately, through the help of gentlemen in the archives in Montgomery, I was able to locate the necessary information. At that point, it was a matter of writing it up. And after the manuscript had been accepted for publication, and I was waiting for the publication to occur, <laughs> a giant whale appeared in the water. It was the second book by Harper Lee. It was actually the first book she wrote, but it's called Go Set a Watchman. And in that book, she described a very different Atticus Finch, one who was bigoted, who attended Klan meetings. He was not the worst of Southern white people, but he was certainly not the Atticus Finch that we all loved in To Kill a Mockingbird. At that point, even though the book had been accepted, I wondered if they would even go forward because there's so much publicity about the other book, and now a lot of people didn't like Atticus anymore. I have a sentence, that, if I may just read it, where I talk about this and how my father was like the Atticus of To Kill a Mockingbird, not like the Atticus of Watchman. And I say this in the preface, if you miss the Atticus of Mockingbird, if you feel sad about the Atticus of Watchman, keep reading. This book is about neither of those fictional characters. Instead, it is about a real life lived with conviction. So I, I hope that as people read the book, they will be reminded of the good Atticus Finch, which certainly was the one that my father was is, uh, <laughs> similar to. The Gregory Peck one in the movie that we all look up to and that so many people, if you read a paper around the time that Ghost of a Watchman comes out, had named their children after Atticus Finch. So you had all these little Atticuses running around and people <laughs> wondering if they should change their names. You can't change a real person the way you can a fictional person. And that was something that I thought of when I'm reading here about your father, because in fiction, you write things, you take liberties. An author like Harper Lee is going to build up some points and lower others, change dialogue. But your father has friends. He has people who do understand. Everybody isn't a stereotype. By the same token here, Charlie White is not the same man in the book. He's not this 
deferential, really compelling fellow. <laughs> As a lawyer yourself, I'm sure if you get a client like that, it's frustrating. He really doesn't want to help in his own defense, doesn't want to answer questions. He's changing things and this and that, changing details. So I wonder against that backdrop of the real world, not the world that's described in either of the Harper Lee books, set the stage for us. What is this world that you describe in this period of my father and Atticus Finch? Alabama, as you said, Southern Alabama, where the trial takes place. For example, you write that the 4th of July wasn't celebrated there at this point in 1938. And there's a monument to John Wilkes Booth in the center of the town square at this time. So paint the picture of what it was like for your father he, just to walk down the street of this town and know he has this burden that he has to defend this man. That's a good series of questions. Let me back up just a little bit. The alleged rape occurred in a place called Troy, Alabama. Troy, Alabama is about an hour south of Montgomery and is a town that was infamous for having a statue of John Wilkes Booth. However, the Troy fathers say that they never commissioned that statue. It was commissioned by a Troy resident who claimed that his brother had been mistreated in a Union prison. Be that as it may, my father was not a lawyer living in Troy. He was a lawyer living in Enterprise, Alabama, which is a little further south. Just to give you a contrast, Enterprise, instead of having a statue to anything as horrible as John Wilkes Booth or even a Confederate soldier, Enterprise had a statue to the boll weevil. A boll weevil, for, for my Yankee friends, is an insect that destroys <laughs> cotton bowls. It came in from Mexico and swept across the South worse than General Sherman. And as a result, the farmers were decimated, the cotton farmers. And in desperation, they planted peanuts and they all made a lot of money. Of course, Jimmy Carter, a little further east, his family was also in peanuts. And so in commemoration of this great arrival by this insect, the boll weevil, my father's town of Enterprise had a statue to the boll weevil, which is humorous. Now, what happened was this. The rape allegedly occurred in Troy, and the lawyers in Troy who could try a case got themselves appointed special prosecutor, which is a baloney excuse, but that gave them a conflict of interest so they could not represent the defendant. There was no need for a special prosecutor. There was a prosecutor in town who was perfectly capable of they didn't want to take this controversial case of a black man raping a white woman. So the judge called my father in Enterprise, and he had seen him try cases. He knew he was a good lawyer and he had courage. And my father agreed to take the case, and that's how he got it. His first introduction, besides the judge's phone call, was to read the Troy Messenger. And the Troy Messenger tells you how the newspaper supported something like this, not exactly a presumption of innocence. The headline says, Negro rush to Kilby Prison after attack. Now, Kilby Prison is in Montgomery, 50 miles away. Why was he rushed from Troy to Kilby in Montgomery? So he wouldn't be lynched that night. That's how bad it was. Here's what the newspaper said happened. A wandering Negro fortune teller giving the name of C.W. White was removed from the Troy jail for safekeeping following his attack on a local white girl. You notice, Dean, how race just creeps in everywhere. Yeah. At Kilby, newspaper reported, quote, the Negro volunteered a detailed confession of the attack, and the confession was reduced to writing and signed in the presence of numerous law enforcement officials. The newspaper continues, a physician called to attend to the girl later confirmed that the Negro had accomplished his dastardly purpose. So <laughs> as far as the newspaper is concerned, it's over. No need for a trial. Yeah. Of course, that was not the end of it. That was just the first day. But that gives you a flavor for the tenor of newspaper reporting. In the early part of this century, I sponsored a series of lectures at Emory University in commemoration of my father. One of the great guests who lectured was a New York lawyer named Floyd Abrams, who's a great American hero himself. Floyd is one of the great defenders of the First Amendment. And I asked Floyd to come and talk about my father and his case and to consider these newspaper articles, which he did. And it was such a great evening at Emory. As long as I'm on that, the other people who lectured at Emory were Anthony Lewis, the Pulitzer Prize winner twice. New York Times correspondent who wrote Gideon's Trumpet about the right to a lawyer in a felony case. Linda Greenhouse, the New York Times legal correspondent, now a professor at Yale Law School. Morris Dees, the very courageous founder of the Southern Poverty Law Center in Montgomery, who fights hate all over the country. And finally, John Lewis, my esteemed congressman, who was born in Troy a year and a half after the trial. And John was the last speaker in the series. 
to give people an idea of the threat that Charles White is under, how many patrolmen were required to protect him? Well, 14 highway patrolmen escorted him from Montgomery to the courthouse in Troy. They were joined by two local patrolmen there, bringing a total of 16, and there was also a sheriff and some deputies. It's interesting that the trial judge, who had some good qualities, frankly, did not want a lynching, not in his courtroom. And so he called the police commandant in Montgomery and asked for this squadron of patrolmen. And at one point, there was a surge by the crowd towards the courthouse, and the highway patrolmen had to assume the position to present arms, and they were ready to shoot if necessary to stop the mob from coming into the courthouse. The judge also imposed pretty strict rules about demonstrations and emotions inside the courtroom. It was a tense situation. Ironically, one of the tense, really tense days was the day the jury was struck. Because after the Scottsboro decision involving a very controversial trial of some black teenagers accused of rape, the trial opinions were twice reversed by the U.S. Supreme Court. But after that second U.S. Supreme Court opinion, it was necessary that blacks be called for possible jury service. They could still be struck from the pool, but they had to at least be called because in the South, they were not even calling them. Two African-American men were called to serve on my father's jury, and the crowd reacted very angrily when they heard that. But then later they heard that the state of Alabama had struck both from serving, and therefore they were not allowed to be on the jury. Women were also not allowed to serve on felony juries like this in those days. So it was an all-white male jury. And they've been reading, I'm sure, things like exactly that in the paper that already have him tried and convicted and are demanding that they do their duty as the newspaper sees it. Those old articles, when you read old sports pages or anything, really, when it's a lighter subject matter, those articles can be funny. And you kind of say, well, even though we also get a lot of politics today in our news, it it isn't with such a flourish. It isn't with the way columnists wrote. I frequently mention my interview with Charles Learson, who wrote Ty Cobb, A Terrible Beauty. And that was one of the things that tipped him off that a bunch of the stories, or in fact, all of the stories about Ty Cobb as a belligerent racist were wrong and made him look into them because he said, People took it as an article of faith that he'd beaten up a black bellboy and a black bellman. And he said, I read the article and he said, the first thing that made me suspicious was they just said bellman and bellboy. And he said, in the early 20th century, if you had a crime and there was a Negro involved, as they said, you would put that right in the headline and you would put it 10 times in the article. You wouldn't just say Cobb fights man on the street. They would write Cobb fights Negro on the street. And that was to sensationalize it and to dehumanize these people that were involved in it. And that's something I very much get there from this. This is something your father would have definitely had to deal with, just this ingrained bias, never mind things people are conscious of. But this jury would have been hostile right from the beginning. How does a lawyer go about confronting those sorts of things? When people read My Father and Atticus Finch, what will they learn about that mindset? Well, I think they will learn a great deal that probably reinforces some of their opinions about the South. There certainly was an unnecessary reference to race in the newspapers. And ironically, it's in the first paragraph of the Alabama Supreme Court opinion, where they refer to, again, the word used at the time was Negro rather than Black or African American. They refer to a Negro and a white girl. And it's unheard of today, fortunately, but back then it was common and it, it speaks volumes. I do want to say this, for those who buy the book, there is a wonderful letter, which is in the back of the book, from Dr. George Washington Carver, the famous black inventor who was at Tuskegee Institute. And he and my grandfather were friends. And he wrote a wonderful letter to my grandfather because my grandfather had written a newspaper article about Dr. Carver. And so I try to illustrate in the book, Dean, that there were some good white people in the South. I mean, there, we have plenty of bad ones, unfortunately. But there were some good ones, too. There's also a bit of humor. I attended a baseball game with my father when I was 11 years old, and it was the first time that blacks had played on a baseball team in our league, which was a Class D baseball. And the Montgomery Rebels, of course, they were called the Rebels. The Rebels were playing a team called the Jacksonville Braves from Jacksonville, Florida. And the first time black players had appeared on the diamond there in Montgomery. And so there was a lot of hostility. We went to the game and sat behind Jacksonville's dugout on the third base side to show our support for the Jacksonville team. 
when the black players came out on the young deck circle, there were shouts of the N-word and other vulgarities. And one of the black players got a really stinging single great hit. And then the second time, I've got a double that rattled the scoreboard and knocked the lights out. <laughs> when the game was over, my father turned to me and he said, son, I don't think we'll get to see him play in Montgomery again. And sure enough, Hank Aaron was called up to the Milwaukee Braves from the Jacksonville Braves <laughs> at the end of that season. I got to meet Hank Aaron in Atlanta not too long ago and asked him if he remembered that story. He just laughed. And he, said, he said, Joe, there were lots of stories like that in the South in those days. <laughs> <laughs> it was one that you got to see, though, and it's something that as a young man at the time, as you were, it reminds me of the – book Brooklyn Bat Boy, that if people are interested in this era of history and they have children of their own, you just had a grandchild, by the way, congratulations. We had to Thank reschedule you. around that, but life takes precedent. We're all still making history. Your daughter made a little bit there herself, but Brooklyn Bat Boy by Jeff Griffin, he looks at it through the eyes of a bat boy. And as I was reading that anecdote about Hank Aaron, I sort of put you in that role. I said, how important is parenting and how important is seeing the way an athlete carries himself? Because you may have never seen, I don't know, was this, you don't mention it in the book, but was this the first time that you had seen black players playing? It, it was, it was not the majors. It was the class B. Right, right. <laughs> but uh, of course I saw, I, I did go to Yankee stadium once when we went to New York. That was when I was older though. But in Montgomery, it was a first, and it was controversial. But, of course, today, happily, we're far past that. One of the things you mentioned that you may want to let me follow up on, Charles White, as he was known, Charles White alias, in contrast with Tom Robinson of To Kill a Mockingbird. We all remember Tom Robinson. He was extremely deferential. Some would call him obsequious. Frankly, for a black man in 1938, Alabama, he had to be that way to survive because almost any kind of independence was resented by some of the white races. Now, that was Tom Robinson. Charles White, Charles White alias, and he did have several names, was not from the Deep South. He was from Detroit and Chicago. <laughs> Probably the worst decision of his life was when he stopped in Troy that day. And he was much more demanding. He was much less deferential. And he was, I guess, for my father, at first, at least a handful to try to keep his expectations consistent with what was to come. You remember, he had confessed to this. And so if I may read a little bit from the book, I say, Charles, you say it didn't happen that way. But then why did you sign that confession, Charles? You don't know? They say I don't sign. They turn around and take me straight back to Troy that night. They say I'm dying on a rope that night. If I sign, they promise I can stay here, where he is in Kilby, Montgomery. I can stay here in this place till the trial. Then I can come back here to serve out my sentence. My father, who promised? Charles, five white men, sheriff, deputy, three others. I would just interject for a moment. It's in the book. Imagine the fear. Mr. White must have fell in a car with five white men with guns in the night, but taking him to a prison. My father, maybe we can suppress the confession on the ground that was coerced, but if we succeed, the state may try to seek the death penalty. Are you all right with a life sentence? Charles, I don't want to go to jail for life for something I didn't do. My father, if you plead in exchange for a promise of life, not the chair, at least you'll be alive. Charles, not how I want to live. My father, Charles, I may be able to bargain for less time than life and make you eligible for parole. Charles, I'm not entering a guilty plea. I want that confession suppressed. My father, well, I think that'll be up to the judge whether to suppress, but Charles, do something for me, lawyer. Charles White interrupted. That's just a few passages from their first meeting in this filthy prison, uh, which was the one designated for black people in Montgomery. Part of Kilby was white and part black, but it was completely segregated. The interesting aspect here, when you have a confession that is given in exchange for a promise of life imprisonment, then the state cannot renege on its promise and ask for the death penalty. So the deal was, sign this confession and you'll get life. But Charles White did not want to go to prison for life for something he didn't do. And he insisted and frankly outmaneuvered my father in taking the stand and testifying. and. You'll have to read the book to find out how it came out. But he testified eloquently. A great deal of the transcript of his testimony is reproduced in the book. And you'll just have to read it and see if you agree with the verdict. My guest is Joseph Madison Beck, author of 
My Father and Atticus Finch, A Lawyer's Fight for Justice in 1930s Alabama. Martin Luther King III said of the book, quote, My father, Martin L. King Jr., lauded To Kill a Mockingbird as a popular and widely respected novel that reflects the American ethos that responds to the strength of moral force. I am confident that my father would find this remarkable account of Foster Beck compelling as it epitomizes the strength of moral force, unquote. People can hear already in your voice that you put a lot of passion into this book, not only because your father's involved, not only because you're a person who loves justice and a lawyer yourself, but because you really felt that this is a family story and you wanted to tell it in a way that your father never did and never could. When you read that quote, as the author of such a personal book, and it encompasses so many family recollections, you talked about the transcript there, and I don't want people to get the idea this is a great big thick law book. Even though you're a lawyer, you have this book moving very quickly. It's almost a thriller in some ways. So this may be the first case ever of a lawyer writing a short book. People sometimes shy away from them, right? They're afraid it's going to be really long and full of legalese. It is certainly not that. But you are a lawyer and you bring that love for justice to the book. So share with us your feelings when you get that reaction from Martin Luther King III. And he says he likes the book and he invokes his father. Well, I'm I'm certainly honored to have that comment from Martin Luther King III. I do think that one of the things that he enjoyed about the book, and frankly, a number of people have commented, is the non-legal part. I spent a lot of time talking about Southern food, Southern customs. You mentioned how Southerners paid more attention to Confederate Memorial Day than to the 4th of July, because Confederate Memorial Day was (laughs) the revolution they tried. 4th of July was the one from Boston and New York. That's not to say that Southerners are unpatriotic. They're probably as more patriotic than most Americans. But growing up, Events like Confederate Memorial Day were revered. There's still parts of Alabama that celebrate it, that take the holiday. Everybody's familiar, I guess, by now with our struggle over the years with getting rid of the Confederate battle flag at state capitals. So there's a lot about Southern food and religion. And my incredible grandfather, who was uh, an extraordinary man himself and a very progressive on the racial question himself, Southern lore. So it's by no means just a book about the law. And it's also a book about what occurred after the trial. And that's the part we're holding out on because we'd like people to read the book. But there's a good deal of information about my father's return to Enterprise after the trial and what transpired there. And then, of course, about what eventually occurred at Emory in commemoration of him. You inherited your middle name, Madison, from your larger-than-life grandfather who you just mentioned there, Mr. M.L. <laughs> you almost want to fill a Pimm's cup or maybe a, I don't know, mint julep when you just hear that name, Mr. M.L. You meet him in My Father and Atticus Finch. He talks about his views of race. Well, you talk about his views of race and the law and their influence on his son, Foster, your father. That plays into his decision not only to take Charlie White's case, but in the way, I guess it's Judge Parker that sort of uses his father's shadow, I guess you'd say, to try to push him into taking the case. That's right. My father was told by the judge, your father, in other words, Mr. ML, would want you to take this case. Well, my, my daddy was going to take the case regardless, but he did not want the judge bringing up his father because there was the father-son rivalry with my grandfather. Mr. ML was larger than life. And he was, as I mentioned in connection with the George Washington, with, with the uh, Dr. Carver matter, he was a progressive on race himself. There's an anecdote. I can tell you're a close reader, Dean, so you've read this, but the way he paid the people at his sawmill might be of interest. He offered them either what they call the Yankee dollar, which was the currency we all use, or special coins that <laughs> he had made up. And it had denominations, 50 cents, a dollar, whatever, and it said ML Beck on them. Now, his workers could take their choice. They could, of course, only use the ML Beck coins at my grandfather's store. Handy. (laughs) Somebody (laughs) else would accept them. But what was amusing and interesting and kind of sweet, the wives of the workers at the sawmill all pushed for their husbands to take the ML Becks, not the Yankee dollar. And the reason was because my grandfather never sold liquor at his store. He consumed a great deal of it. (laughs) He was certainly one to find ways to bring whiskey into Alabama during Prohibition. But 
he didn't sell it at his store. So if they got the ML backs, they'd have to spend it on clothing for their children and food for the house and things like that rather than on whiskey. He was a character. They knew they weren't going to drink their paycheck. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Again, a fast read, but because you have a character like that who, I mean, he seems like a character. I try not to call real historic people that lived characters, but you can't help but see this is somebody who is so fleshed out, who really did love life, also loved his liquor a little bit. So, you know, this all comes through in the book. The judge in any legal drama is also a large figure. Judge Parks, I wanted you to tell us a little bit about him because he has a challenge here too. A judge is also going to have a lot of pressure in this sort of case. This isn't like Perry Mason or any of the other legal shows we have. This is real life. He has to go back and live in this town. There's no rural credits. Who was Judge Parks and how did he try to do justice in this case? Well, I think beginning with the fact that he asked my father to defend it because he knew my father would fight it with all his heart. And that showed that he wanted a full and fair defense. And he said that. He said he wanted somebody from the South to do it. And he thought that maybe it would be a better outcome. He also showed character, I think, in the fact that he insisted that Charles White be transported the day he was arrested from Troy to Montgomery. So he would not be lynched that night. He again showed character in calling the commandant and having the escorts and the detachment of highway patrolmen surround the trial to protect Mr. White from lynching. At one point, my father, on cross-examination, developed some explosive testimony that brought very much into question whether a rape had occurred at all, in fact, demonstrated that it had not due to the physical intactness of the female. There was no rape. And because of that, the judge adjourned and called the lawyers into conference. And he told the district attorney there's no way those 12 men are going to be able to believe that that 250-pound black man got between the legs of that little white girl and didn't break her maidenhead. And therefore, we're going to have a hung jury. And he turns to my father and he says, and Foster, you know, there's no way that all 12 of those jurors are going to acquit. So we'll have to retry it. And here's the deal I will offer. I will grant Charles White life with a short term and a guarantee of parole and he'll be out in a reasonable amount of time, and you have my word on it. And my father tried to convince Charles White to do this because he knew that sooner or later, either at this trial or at a later trial, there was going to be a conviction and a sentence of death. And so there's some very interesting back and forth between my father and Charles White. And Charles White, frankly, demonstrates his own brilliance and the way he negotiated and maneuvered with my father over this. It's fascinating. Now, the judge on hearing that his offer of a deal was not acceptable, I think at that point had a little bit of a change of heart. I think at that point he wanted to get this case out of the way. And so if you read the instructions given to the jury on the law, you may be able to detect at that point that the judge was beginning to think there should be a conviction. It's interesting because there were no instructions in To Kill a Mockingbird. Harper Lee, of course, hers is fiction. She had no instructions to go on. But I have the transcript. So I have exactly what the judge told the jury that the law was. And that's one of the most revealing aspects of the case, the way he described to the jury what the law of Alabama was. You mentioned the woman that's the accuser here. And that struck me as something to put a little bit later in the interview, because the focus is my father and Atticus Finch of your book, which is why it's the title, and then Charles White. But also because one thing hasn't changed in these many decades, almost a century since Charles White alias goes to trial, and that is we are still very hesitant to question a rape victim. When a woman comes forward, I feel, and you may know better in jury selection and this kind of thing, but people are very hesitant, race aside, to start probing these things, to start saying, well, I don't know, your testimony is shifting, or how did this or that happen, or are you just embarrassed, are you covering something? It's a terrible thing to have to dig down into that, and yet that's part of your father's job here with all this other pressure socially ladled onto him. So who was the woman in this case, and how does your father handle this delicate task as you're reading this transcript, as you're reading this mountain of information, you're kind of looking over your father's shoulder. That has to be a strange sensation. How do you see him handling this? Well, when a witness testifies on what's called direct, which is the answers to the questions asked by the prosecution, 
if she, in a rape case, goes into detail about the rape, the last thing that the defense lawyer wants to do is have all that repeated because it's so horrible to hear a woman mistreated like that. And so my father certainly did not want to elicit testimony that repeated all that. But at the same time, he needed to ask her some questions. Now, the way she described the event, it occurred on a Tuesday afternoon when she went to have her fortune told. And she said that Mr. White uh, put some salve on what was called her private parts and then raped her. But without going back over the actual facts of the rape, what my father was able to, to establish was Tuesday afternoon was not the first time she saw Mr. White. The first time she saw him was Monday. And she claimed on cross-examination that he applied salves to her private parts that day. She then came back on Tuesday for more fortune telling and more salve, and then Tuesday afternoon a third time. And so this is a woman who portrays this application of salve to her private parts as something undesirable and possibly even kind of molestation sexually itself. But in fact, she was very complicit in it and that she kept coming back for more. What's going on here, Dean, is something that also has a parallel in To Kill a Mockingbird. In To Kill a Mockingbird, you remember Tom Robinson was kissed by that young white woman whose father accused Tom of rape. And as Harper Lee wrote, it was something unspeakable in the South that a white and black person would kiss. Well, something unspeakable may have occurred in my father's case based on that application of South. Charles White denied he touched her with South, but something may have gone on that was unspeakable in the minds of that jury. In other words, even though this woman was physically intact in terms of her maidenhead, had they embraced, kissed, or touched in a way that would be intimate, that would be unspeakable in the South in those days. And it's another striking parallel with To Kill a Mockingbird, as is the fact that the prosecutrix in both my father's case and in To Kill a Mockingbird, the alleged victim, was a woman of limited intelligence, a poor background, not impoverished, but you know, not a wealthy person, and in some senses helpless. And so there are lots of parallels between the two cases, some others I refer to in the book itself. Again, I emphasize that I take Ms. Lee absolutely at her word. And is it conceivable that she heard something about it as a 12-year-old and remembered it 20 or 30 years later when she wrote her book? Possible. Doesn't matter. My father's case was public. Anybody could write about it that wanted to. Maybe she heard about it, maybe she didn't, but there are some interesting parallels between the two women. You write in My Father and Atticus Finch, quote, the passed down memory of the lost cause shaped the spirit of the white South far into the 20th century, unquote. Now here we are in the 21st century. How do you see people in the South or how do you find people in the South reacting to stories you've shared in this book? I've had a considerable interest in the South. Of course, the South today is a very different place than it was in 1938. And that's true all over the South. Atlanta is basically a blue city, a very progressive city, a wonderful place to live. But I've been delighted to receive correspondence from people in Nevada, Colorado, earlier today from Oregon, Washington State. So somebody's reading the book <laughs> around the country. I'm glad to know that. And so far, you know, knock on wood, it's been great. People who loved it have said nice things. I've gotten good reviews on Goodreads and Amazon, as well as good reviews in the, the press that has covered it. So I think people are glad to have a book like this. And maybe given all the tensions that we have and the partisanship that we have these days, a story like this is helpful to make us all feel a little better about ourselves. It is something to see people look at the past. And I think it's really something that so much of the world doesn't have. It's very popular today to just sort of fall back on this phrase, well, in this country, we do this wrong. And we it's almost a passive way of saying, well, I'm enlightened and I disagree with everything and everything bad that ever happened. It's not really something we think about. But the positive side of it is, I did an interview recently with Lou Urenic, the author of Smyrna, September 1922, about the Great Fire, about the Greek genocide of the city of Smyrna, and about the genocide against the Armenians. This is something that the Turkish government denies for a hundred years. And you look at the Japanese, the way that they face the past is nowhere near like the way Germany faces it. Germany faces very squarely the Holocaust and the things that they did. 
And I think that this is something that we can be proud of the way we are willing to look back. It doesn't mean you're tearing open wounds if you're looking back and seeing how things were. Nobody is certainly is pure, but we can try to apply it to our own lives. And that's something I wanted to ask you as our final question as we wrap up. We talked about how fictional characters can be rewritten, how they can be changed, much to the chagrin of all those parents who named their children after Atticus Finch or who really loved the book and then felt like he was taken away from them by Ghost at a Watchman. But your father is a real human being, so tell us, this story 100% true, whether you're a lawyer or a layperson, what do you hope that reader takes away from reading My Father and Atticus Finch, what do you hope that they apply to their lives when they look at your father really worshiping, putting the law up on a pedestal, and handling the Charlie White case the way that he knew he had to? I hope it restores some of the faith that people had in our justice system and in in the goodness of some lawyers, and restores their image of the Atticus Finch of Mockingbird. There was a lot of disappointment and chagrin when Watchmen was published, and some people didn't even want to read it after reading the reviews in the New York Times. What this book stands for is you can go back to the Atticus of Mockingbird because there was somebody like that who was real, who actually did that. Now, I don't want to imply that my father was the only white Southerner, or for that matter, white Northerner, who was courageous in defending unpopular cases. There have been plenty of them. One of them is Morris Dees, who also has a nice comment about the book, the courageous founder of the Southern Poverty Law Center in Montgomery. But my father's case, one little case in South Alabama, is a true case, and it stands for the proposition that there really was someone like the Atticus Finch, the fictional character of To Kill a Mockingbird. Well, Joseph Madison Beck, my father, and Atticus Finch is a reminder of exactly that, that beyond being a fictional tale, To Kill a Mockingbird reflected very real victims, but also heroes of all colors, all races, in pre-civil rights America. So I want to thank you very much for sharing the moral force of this tale of Charlie White's trial with us today. I hope people, rather than being irritated that we didn't give them the end, will instead, we're doing it for your own good. We're doing it so that you can enjoy this book as much as I know I did, as much as Martin Luther King III did, and so many others. Thank you for joining me, and best of luck with the book. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. Again, the book is My Father and Atticus Finch, A Lawyer's Fight for Justice in 1930s Alabama. As always, you can find the Amazon link to purchase your copy at historyauthor.com. And we hope you will click through there or even bookmark the URL off our homepage banner for all your online purchases. Amazon.com gives us a small percentage of every purchase you make at no additional cost to you. Once again, thank you to Joseph Madison Beck for joining me and for sharing the story of his father's defense in the Charlie White case. Let us know what you think of the book and the interview on Twitter at History Dean or Facebook.com slash History Author. I hope you'll join us for next Monday's all-new interview, same bat time, same bat channel, as the saying goes, right here on iHeartRadio. And remember, if you subscribe to us on iTunes, please take a minute to leave us a review. I want to thank Rob Hillard for taking the time to do just that. Rob is an environmental scientist, public speaker, and author of A Season on the Allegheny, about the Allegheny National Forest. It was great to see a name there, look it up, and say, hey, this guy's an author. Maybe we ought to have him on the show. So if you're trying to catch our eye, please go to iTunes and leave us a review. The stars mean a lot. Until our next trip into the past together, thanks so much for time traveling with us, and have a great week. We still call it Broadway, but what's in a name? Take it from Georgie, it isn't the same. On the east side, west side. Sign things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore.